already been said. Perfect. Well, it looks like we hit four o'clock. So I'm just going to go ahead and start the session. Um, first of all, if there's any virtual viewers out there, my name is Sarah Smallwood. I am a Festival of Science board member, and I'm joined here today with James, Kim, and Elizabeth. If you guys just want to give a quick hello and introduce yourself and what you do with Momentum, that would be great. Cool. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, my name is James E. I'm a mechanical engineer and I work for a company called WL Born Associates, medical device company. And I've been doing aerial for more than five years. Um, I mostly just train and perform and it's been a lot of fun. Hey, thanks for the intro, Sarah. Um, my name is Elizabeth or Liz. I um, am an aerial instructor at uh, Momentum Aerial. Um, I have been doing aerial for around six years. I've uh, been teaching for three or more years. Um, and I also, I got my degree um, from NAU in physics and astronomy. And I'm Kim Samuels Crow, and I'm an assistant research professor in the School of Informatics, Computing, and Cyber Systems at NAU. I'm a I'm a climate scientist, and at Momentum, if I can zoom in here, ooh, there. Uh, in the background is one of my postdoc field areas because uh, I study land atmosphere interactions, so kind of water and carbon moving between the ecosystems in the atmosphere. And um, at Momentum, I'm a student. I've been taking classes for about four and a half years in Silks and Lyra, and I um, am also an apprentice instructor. So I'm learning how to teach. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for being here with us today. Um, a few housekeeping things for any viewers. You are able to uh, send in questions for this session. We're gonna show a video that these three so graciously put together for the presentation, but afterwards there will be a Q&A. So if you jump over to scifest2020.org, that's where you can submit your questions and we'll be able to ask our presenters in real time. Um, so if you wanna do that on your cell phone or pop open a new tab, go ahead and do that. Otherwise, let's start the video. to How Do They Do That? The Physics of Aerial Arts, presented by Momentum Aerial. Momentum Aerial is a woman-owned aerial studio founded in 2018 and located right here in Flagstaff, Arizona. If you find yourself inspired by what you are about to see, you can register for one of the conditioning or skills-based classes that Momentum offers. Momentum Aerial has adopted strict COVID-19 protocols to keep our aerialists and community safe please check out the website for more information. For the next half hour or so, we will be presenting a whirlwind view of some of the physics concepts that keep aerialists in the air and our audiences on their toes. This won't be an exhaustive lesson, but we hope it will inspire you to delve more deeply into physics and into the intersections between the arts and the sciences. 
Before we get started, I want to introduce you to a few of the people responsible for this presentation. First, I'd like to introduce Elizabeth Garrett. Liz has a bachelor's degree in physics and astronomy from NAU. She worked as a public program educator at Lowell Observatory for three years and currently works on the technical support team at Handshake, a job recruitment and career services platform for higher education. In addition to being a STEM superstar, Liz is an avid rock climber, has been doing aerial dance for six years, and is an instructor at Momentum Aerial. Next, James Yee has a master's degree in mechanical engineering from Oregon State University. He is a design engineer at WL Gore and Associates. He and his team are developing an innovative implantable medical devices. When he's not saving lives by designing medical devices, James is a volunteer stagehand for the Flagstaff Foundry, serves on the Flagstaff Arts and Leadership Academy Board of Directors, and is an aerial performer with Dark Sky Aerial, an award-winning site-specific ambulatory aerial theater company based in the Western United States. Finally, I'm Kimberly Samuels Crow. I have a PhD in Earth and Planetary Sciences from the University of New Mexico. I'm a climate scientist with interests in land atmosphere interactions, and I'm currently an assistant research professor in NAU's School of Informatics, Computing, and Cyber Systems. I've been taking aerial classes for about four and a half years now, and I'm an apprentice instructor at Momentum Aerial. We hope you are inspired to try taking a class, but we do not recommend that you rush out and start doing aerial on your own. Please have a seat while our rigor friend Keith Thorne tells you a few reasons why. Thanks for the introduction, Kim. I just want to impress upon you the seriousness of the situation before we move on to anything else. Uh, first of all, the uh, falls are the second leading cause of death worldwide. The effects of gravity are extremely dangerous and they're not to be taken lightly. Aerial is certainly included in that. There's no way to practice aerial without subjecting yourself to a potentially fatal fall or serious injury. So with that in mind, you really need to protect yourself. The first thing is don't try to do aerial at home. Don't try to rig for yourself. Don't try to rig in trees, at parks or anything like that. Only do aerial at an approved and official school. A school like that will have a trained instructors who've been doing this for a very long time and who have a flawless safety record. Uh, and they'll also have rated equipment for professional use, not recreational climbing gear and things like that, but rated equipment that's professionally installed by a qualified individual. As a rule of thumb, if you wouldn't hang a car from it, you shouldn't be hanging yourself from it either. Well. Thanks for bumming everyone out, Keith. Now that we've gotten all that introductory material out of the way, let's move on to physics and aerial arts. Let's start by talking about forces. First, what is a force? In physics, a force is the amount of push or pull acting on an object. In this diagram, the force of gravity pulls the object toward Earth, while the normal force exhibited by the surface pushes in the opposite direction. In this case, the arrows or vectors are the same length, which, which indicates the forces are equal. Since the forces are in balance, the object is at rest. In aerial, there are many examples of times when the gravitational and normal forces are equal. Analyzing this aerial demonstration may be more complex if you consider the physical exertion of the aerialist, but for the purpose of this discussion, we'll consider only the external forces. Gravity is pulling the aerialist toward the ground, while the Lyra apparatus is lifting the aerialist up. On a soft apparatus, like the silks or rope, it's important to hold the apparatus in a way that will exert a normal force upward or perpendicular to the ground. Holding the silk at an incorrect angle 
could result in falling onto the mat. Forces, let's take a moment to talk about gravity. One of the things that makes Ariel so amazing is that aerialists seemingly defy gravity. Gravity is a fundamental force that pulls any object with mass to any other object with mass. The more mass of an object, the greater the gravitational pull. So the Earth pulls us towards it. That's why we don't just float around. But we also pull on the Earth a little bit. In Ariel, we rely on our strength to keep us in the air and on skills and techniques to keep us safe when we finally give in to the pull that the Earth's gravity exerts on us. We've talked about the case where the downward force of gravity is balanced by an upward force so the object stays still. But we don't always stay still in the aerial arts. It's time to move on to some physical laws that govern motion in everyday life, in the atmosphere, in our solar system, and even in aerial arts. What happens when forces are not in balance? In the 17th century, Sir Isaac Newton described three laws of motion. Newton's first law of motion describes inertia. This law states that unless another force acts on an object, the object will continue doing what it was initially doing. An object at rest tends to stay at rest, and an object in motion tends to stay in motion. Aerial drops are a type of movement that involves an aerialist in a brief fall. For safety, the aerialist sets up a situation where something will stop his or her motion toward the floor. Examples include wrapping a silk in a special way or aiming the lira at his or her body. It doesn't always feel great at first, but it's better to get caught by the apparatus than fall on the ground. Newton's second law tells us that the force exerted on an object is proportional to the object's mass and its acceleration. Let's look at a quick demonstration. This law contributes to safety considerations in aerial. The equations that determine the maximum force exerted on, for example, a silk during a drop also take into account the apparatus's properties, the distance that the aerialist drops, and the length of the silk. Even an aerialist who weighs 100 pounds puts a dynamic force of at least twice their body weight on the apparatus when accelerating towards the floor. A heavier aerialist will put even more force on that apparatus. <clears throat> As Keith told us at the beginning, it's best to only embark on an aerial journey on equipment that you would feel confident hanging a car off of, since even the tiniest of us might as well weigh a thousand pounds or more while doing a big drop. Newton's third law tells us that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction, as illustrated by air escaping from a balloon and propelling that balloon forward. We can get some first-hand experience with the third law right now. If you're seated or standing near a table, put your hands on that table or on a wall and push against it. I don't know about you, but I move backwards when my arms move forward. Thank you, Newton's third law. There are a number of examples of this law in the aerial arts. Spinning on a rope or silk is a great example. Spinning the silk clockwise makes the aerialist spin counterclockwise, while spinning the silk counterclockwise makes the aerialist spin clockwise. The aerialist will spin at a rate proportional to the rate at which he or she spins the tail of the silk. So the faster you spin the tail, the faster you will move in the opposite direction. Sometimes Newton's third law can work against you if you don't want to be swinging, but you accidentally jumped into an invert. Oops. Before we 
we move on from our discussion of forces, let's talk about one more important force, friction. Even though it's not a fundamental force like gravity, it is absolutely essential for keeping aerialists in the air. Friction is a force that opposes motion. In this diagram, the object is being pulled down by gravity, supported by the normal force, being pulled or pushed to the right by some applied force, and being held back by friction. Both vertical arrows are equal in length, and both horizontal arrows are also equal in length. In this example, we see that the forces are balanced and the object is at rest. The force of friction is proportional to a coefficient of friction, which is related to the interaction of the objects in contact with each other. The coefficient of friction largely depends on the materials and surfaces of the objects. There are two types of friction, static friction and kinetic friction. Static friction is the friction between objects that are not moving relative to each other. During the stride of our walk, when we put our foot on the ground, static friction keeps our foot in that location until we pick it up again. This allows the rest of our body to continue the forward motion of our walk. Kinetic friction is the friction between objects that are moving relative to each other. You may have also heard this referred to as dynamic friction or sliding friction. If you push a book across a table, eventually it will slow down and stop, if the table is long enough. This is an example of kinetic friction. There are many ways friction comes into play in aerial arts. Climbing or ascending an apparatus is one of them. Similar to the example of walking, in a climb, we position the silk in a way that allows us to take advantage of static friction to make progress upward, away from the floor. This is one of the most common ways that aerialists defy gravity. If you wear socks in a climb like this, the coefficient of friction is less, and you have to work a lot harder not to fall onto the mat. Last but not least, we would like to talk about momentum, a physics concept so important in aerial arts, the studio here in Flagstaff is named for it. Momentum is basically the amount of motion displayed by a moving object. Mathematically, the linear momentum of an object is the product of the object's mass and its velocity. In aerial, we can increase our linear momentum to help us move more easily between different heights. For example, a dead hang pull-up in a lira is pretty difficult. Tucking into a ball makes things easier because we change the way our mass is distributed. Easiest of all though is doing a beat. When we do beats to move between different heights or poses, we increase our linear momentum by increasing our linear velocity. We also change the way that our mass is distributed. This increase in momentum helps us achieve new heights, whether we are getting into a trapeze or doing some dynamic moves on a rope. Linear momentum is all well and good, but one of the things that makes aerial dance fun to watch is spinning, and spinning allows us to play with angular momentum. Angular momentum is a measure of an object's motion around an axis. Like linear momentum, it's a function of the object's mass and velocity, angular velocity in this case. But how the object's mass is distributed around its center of mass is very important for angular momentum. In this equation, I is the moment of inertia. There are different functions to describe it, but those functions depend on the object's mass and its radius, or the distance from the object's center, over which that mass is distributed. The Greek letter omega, the little w symbol, is angular velocity. Something very important to note is that momentum, whether linear or angular, is a conserved quantity. 
That means the number on the left-hand side of the equation, L, will stay the same even as the quantities on the right-hand side of the equation are perturbed. What does that mean? That means if we decrease one of the quantities that contributes to the moment of inertia, I, then the velocity will increase in an effort to keep the angular momentum constant. Let me give you an everyday example. If you have a spinny office chair, you can participate in this. If not, just sit back and watch. Lauren is sitting in an office chair, thinking about her master's thesis. She gives herself a spin, establishing her angular momentum. If she pulls her arms and legs in closer to her body, she decreases her moment of inertia, not by changing her mass, but by changing the radius over which that mass is distributed. As her moment of inertia, the I term, decreases, her angular velocity, omega, increases in order to maintain a constant angular momentum. The conservation of angular momentum allows us to play with our spin, making our choreography more interesting. All of these moves look a little different, but they rely on the same principle. Given an initial amount of angular momentum, we can change our angular velocity by making ourselves smaller or bigger in an effort to make ourselves spin faster or slower. All good things must come to an end though. Eventually, friction in the rigging will stop us from spinning. In this presentation, we covered only a few of the physical principles that we use in aerial arts to dazzle our audiences and keep ourselves safe. There are many more topics and areas of study that apply to our movement. In addition to Newton's laws of motion, momentum, friction, and the force of gravity, aerialists use principles of biomechanics along with their own physical strength and flexibility while training and performing. Aerial is more than physics and physical exertion though. Instead, aerial arts incorporate science and strength to bring a vertical dimension to dance. The next time you see aerialists performing, we hope you will be dazzled, but maybe the physics embedded in the art will be part of the magic. Wow, thank you so much, you guys. That was a great presentation. Um, we appreciate you putting it together for the festival. Um, can, I, can I just interject? I feel like the credits fly by really quickly, but you know, the three of us have our faces on here, but I wanna make sure we acknowledge particularly Lauren Burnus, who tirelessly put together that video and without her, we would not have a presentation at all. Um, I also wanna thank Aaron Cause for being an amazing aerialist and doing some of those demonstrations and the student showcase performers and the performance performers shown in the still videos as uh, still images and then um, Bailey whose name is whose last name is escaping me who was the student showcase videographer. I just want to make sure that those names are out there as people who contributed really heavily to this presentation. Absolutely, thanks. Thank you for including those folks. Um, we will see if any questions from the audience do come in, but the first one that's just on the tip of my brain is, I see you guys doing this, I see it happening in town, I just watched the video, and I still think to myself, you have to be super human strength to be able to do this aerial dance. Can you guys shatter that myth for me? Is this something that everybody can do or... How does it work? Absolutely, everyone can do it. Um, I wasn't as strong as I am now um, at all. I mean, so, and, and the concepts that we talk about in the video are a great example of progressions that we actually use in our curriculum at Momentum. So 
we won't start you off doing something with straight arms, with a straight body, because that's really difficult and does require some strength, um, you know, a strength threshold. So we'll start things with bent arms, bent legs, with um, support from either a bar apparatus that's rigged down low um, so that it's not difficult to get into, or with fabric, typically what we'll do is we'll tie a knot in the fabric um, so that it acts as more of a sling or um, you can think of like a swing shape um, rather than just two poles. So it's it feels really intimidating when you see videos. Um, I mean, I felt the same way, um, but it, it's all just little steps at a time. I'll also add that the uh, instructors at Momentum are very great and they're caring. So uh, they want to see you succeed wherever your comfort level is and they'll give you appropriate corrections or alternative variations to any of the exercises or movements to help you work up toward uh, uh, that, pro that progress. And we also, uh, at Momentum, like to use spotters to help uh, reduce some of those physical loads and also introduce a little bit more safety uh, if somebody is uh, concerned about a movement or is just unsure about executing it and that sort of thing. And I, I'd like to add, like, so I started doing aerial four and a half years ago. I am 47 years old and a mom, and I have been hit by a pickup truck while on my bike. So when I started doing aerial, I had, you know, I was recovering from injuries. I, you know, I was a runner, but I didn't have much core strength. And, you know, I frankly couldn't lift both my feet off the ground at the same time. And you know, I was the one doing the dead hang pull up in the demonstration. So that's, you know, you don't have to be strong to start doing aerial because there are these progressive techniques and there are also these, um, you know, these physical principles that can help you. Um, but, you know, you become strong by doing it. So if you're looking for like a fun workout in with a supportive community that, you um, you know, that, that you can do to gain strength. If you're looking for something like that, it's great. And right now, um, you know, momentum is open, but due to COVID-19 concerns, there are also some conditioning classes and flexibility classes that are offered via Zoom. And um, there's even aerial yoga for people who wanna get started. And that's taught by Amy Flory, who's, um, who owns Core Balance and she's a physical therapist and she can, you know, just talk you through whatever's ailing you. So it's, it really is a great sport slash art to get into and it's, it's a lot of fun. That's great. It's very inclusive, ready for all levels. And I love that. Um, we did have a question come in. Josh from Flagstaff wants to know, are the silks actually made of silk and how much weight can they hold? That's a great question, Josh. Um, so silks are actually made out of nylon tricot. Um, so it's a synthetic fabric. Um, I, Kim, I don't know if you ended up calculating the, I feel like it was unclear whether or not we were gonna do that, um, calculating the breaking strength of that material, but it's extremely high. Um, so especially something to take into consideration too is when we purchase these fabrics, we purchase them at a specific width. Um, so the breaking strength will change depending on if you have a fabric that say, um, I think we typically buy them at 108 centimeters wide um, versus if you had something that was 10 centimeters wide because there's less material um, that that load is going to be distributed across. And I didn't calculate that and I was really struggling. I wanted to include like that E term. I was hoping to find an actual value for that. Um, and I found estimates of different values for different types of synthetic fabrics, but not for the specific ones that the silks are made out of. And um, you know, so when I did the actual calculation, it's like the minimum you can get is double the aerialist's weight, right? But um, so yeah, I did look into that, but I couldn't find estimates of that. But then the, um, the silks themselves come with different degrees of stretchiness. Like if you look online at different retail, you know, different places where you can buy an aerial silk, they'll have fabric that have different elasticity to them. The ones at Momentum are not that like they're not the crazy ones that like you try to climb and you are still on the floor. 
uh, cause they're so stretchy, but, um, you know, so there are, uh, variations within that, but the equipment, like Keith was talking about, it's all rated to bear very high loads and, um, yeah. So you, you could feel confident hanging a car off of those. Yeah, I just, um, so I just looked at a quick average estimate. Um, it's around 3,000 pounds oh, wow. um, that aerial silks can hold. So once again, that's going to change depending on the elasticity of the fabric and the width of the fabric, but that's just kind of a general, just so you have a general idea uh, around the weight of a car. <laughs> yeah, that's a great reference. Um, you know, it's really interesting how much science is behind this or in, in, tangled in the arts of aerial arts. Um, what are some of the additional physics or biomechanical concepts that are really important but just didn't quite make it into the video? Is there any uh, few you wanna just throw out there for the audience? Yeah, there are tons of biomechanical um, processes or concepts that we use all the time in aerial from the time you warm up to the time you cool down and everything in between. Uh, lots of examples include, um, you know, like pushing and pulling and where that power comes from in your own body. So for example, you do a pull up and uh, as you may imagine, if you've tried to do a pull up, uh, your arms are definitely working, but there's also uh, if you're able to, you can engage your back muscles, some of your core muscles, uh, and there's a lot of um, concepts that are taught in aerial that also have to do with what's called neural pathways, or what I like to call like the mind-body connection. So, you know, your brain might tell you, oh, I want to do this thing, but if you're um, not as experienced, for example, your body might not be familiar with putting yourself in specific positions. So developing and progressing in aerial, um, we utilize a lot of biomechanical um, uh, concepts and uh, work towards getting strong, but also um, working on mobility, range of motion, flexibility, and that sort of thing. Uh, Kim, Liz, do you have anything to add? I want to talk about levers for, for a minute. Um, so Liz mentioned, you know, if you go to a level 1A class, you are not going to be asked to invert with straight arms and straight legs on day one or even on the last day of the semester. It's a really hard skill to learn. But one thing you can do to progress towards that is invert with bent arms or bent legs. And that you can kind of think about a simple lever when you think about why that would be easier. So if you think about a simple lever, you have a load on one end, you have a fulcrum somewhere, and then you have your lever arm, right, that you're going to push down on. Hey, Kim, just for reference, for folks who may not be familiar with the term lever, as far as aerial goes, it's when if you're, you know, normally we have our feet and they're dangling toward the ground, but in a lever, you position your body horizontally and you stay there. You can do a forward lever where your face is pointing up. You can also do a backward lever <laughs> where your face is pointing uh, forward, but your, your stomach is facing down. So that's, those are like very, very difficult and challenging moves. And Kim was getting into how you can progress on this. Yeah, so I was, I was actually just thinking about like how you invert, like just, you know, if you want to, like you're holding onto the silk, like in that climb that Liz was doing where she was just going upside down, hooking her knee and sitting up. If you're just trying to invert from day one, you can think of your body as a lever, not even thinking about a lever pose in aerial, but you can think about your body as a lever where like your legs are the load, your core is the fulcrum, and then your leverage comes from your arms, right? So if you bend your legs towards the fulcrum, like if you have your load, I'm gonna draw a little picture because can you see that with my virtual background? You can't, no one can see anything. So forget that. But if you have a fulcrum, you want it, you can kind of put it closer to your load, right? And then use a longer lever arm to pick it up. And I think about that when I'm trying to invert because it was, I really struggled with inverting when I first started. And so if I, 
bent my legs, they were closer to that center of mass where I was trying to invert from. So that's what I think of. Um, not even getting into lever poses, good God, that's, that's super advanced. But um, yeah, just, just when you're kind of starting out. And then there's another place where I think about levers and that's in moves like some of the um, 360 drops on a silk, like a salto or um, in something that's called scrapey back on a lira. It's, it's a terrible, terrible name, but um, where you're trying to reinvert, you're trying to get yourself back upright but suddenly you have something that you're working with. So in scrapey back, you're upside down on top of the lira between the straps that hold the lira to the ceiling. And you're trying to bring the lira with you while you go back right side up. And for that, the lever part is your legs at that point. You're trying to really whip them down while you pull this other piece up. So I think about those kind of simple machine concepts a lot when I'm struggling with a move. Yeah, that's a great way of thinking of it. And there's definitely a lot there and we could impact more, but there are a few more questions and we just have a bit more time. So I'm gonna go through them. Um, Francis from Flagstaff is wondering what beginning aerial activities can you start with at home on the ground? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would say um, an awesome tool to get for yourself. I mean, you can get some free weights, um, but also a pull-up bar. Um, you can do a lot of different things on a pull-up bar. Um, so a few things um, that a few muscle groups that we use a lot in aerial um, are shoulders, back and core. Um, and so strengthening your shoulders, I mean, pull-ups and um, lots of general, so overhead pushing and pulling. Um, so those are very common um, movement pathways. Um, and, um, and then core work, um, you know, anything that will so, so an exercise that um, I give a lot of folks that are working on core strength is something that we call a VEP. Um, and so you start with your body flat on the ground, um, you're laying with your back on the floor and you're basically folding yourself up in half in a V shape. Um, and so this is gonna uh, imitate the inversion pathway that we take in every single apparatus um, in aerial. But, um, more great groundwork can be found in our conditioning classes, classes that you can take from home if you don't want to come to the studio, um, beginner friendly, and that'll cover basically all of the um, all of the aerial muscles that you need to get started. Great. Uh, Virginia wrote in and she's wondering, can you talk about the stresses that aerial arts put on your body or your joints and how do you protect yourself from injury while practicing? Uh, oh my gosh, this is such a great question. Thank you, Virginia. Um, I think something that is tough for active aerialists to recognize is that taking rest and full rest days is so important for your body to recover. Uh, you use, like you said, it's, it's very stressful on your body to be doing all these uh, very complicated motions. You're using tons of muscle groups and you're really exerting yourself, you want to, if you want to progress and progress safely, the, one of the best things you can do is give yourself some time to recover. Give your body the sleep that it needs, the nutrition that it needs, and the water that it needs. Stay hydrated. Um, particularly in Flagstaff, we live in this dry desert climate, really easy to get dehydrated. So um, some of the things to help prevent injury are actually not at the studio. They're at your home, in your bed, in your kitchen. Uh, and yeah. Perfect. Okay, we'll call this one the last question. Um, but McKenna from Flagstaff wants to know, do you always start from the first level or do, can you test uh, to go to a different level at Momentum? Yeah, so we do have a lot of students that have come in from other locations and do have aerial experience. Um, so yeah, we absolutely accept um, folks in higher levels if they test in um, basically just so that we 
um, can confirm that they do have the appropriate strength, body awareness, and technique um, to be placed in the appropriate setting. That's another great example of injury prevention too, um, because if you're working on something that's not at your level and you don't have the correct strength um, and like proprioception in your mind-body connection that James mentioned, um, that's, that's a great way to get injured, which we wanna prevent if at all possible. Well, that sounds totally reasonable. Kim, James, Liz, I wanna thank you for being a part of the 2020 Festival of Science. Uh, quickly, if you wanna let the viewers know, how do they learn more about Momentum Aerial? Where can they get more information? Uh, so our website is momentumaerial.org. Um, so all, all lowercase. Um, and so we have information on our classes, our current schedule for the fall semester, what's drop-in friendly and how those classes are hosted, like we said, either virtually or, um, or, or in person, um, which we do have um, masks as a requirement and um, social distancing for, for all of our in-person classes. Um, you can also check our Facebook page as well. Um, so you'll just look up Momentum Aerial um, on Facebook. Great. And just a reminder to the viewers um, for festival events, please visit uh, SciFest2020.org. It is just Tuesday and the festival continues through this Sunday, the 27th, with lots of things still happening virtually. There are a few in-person things going on. So check it all out on the SciFest website. Thank you guys again for joining me. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Sarah. Thank